one piece of turkey? No. Mm-hmm. You don't know what you're missing. Mm-hmm. What? Jack You think I could survive an entire weekend on Jack Links and Jack Daniels? Yes. <laughs> Damn right I can. Seven stories tall to hold 20,000 barrels. Each one of those 20,000 barrels will be rolling in there as 53 gallons of whiskey. Walking down the bridge to historic Lynchburg. Lynchburg, Tennessee, at the Jack Daniels facility. All right, y'all, come on. You got everybody got your drink? Thanks, Terry. See you, brother. All right, y'all, this is the Rick Yard. It's called the Rick Yard because of those stacks of wood over there. One stack is a Rick. If you buy firewood around this area, then you buy well, most places in the south. It's called a quarter of a Rick. That's one Rick of hardwood sugar maker. Comes with an 80 mile radius to Jack Daniels. It's got four foot length two by twos, but a four number contract to the supply too, like I told you earlier. Now, Darren and Tracy, that's the two cats that do this for us. But if you look, that's them on the walls. They ain't real photogenic, but that's them. <laughs> They'll spread it southern on there, you know, get that fire started. It burns to about 1,800 degrees. About an hour and a half, two hours sometimes. During that burn process, you'll see Darren and Tracy grab a hose, spray water on that fire. If they spray too much too soon, they get a bunch of unburned sugar maple. Too little, too late, they'll get a bunch of sugar maple ash. Here in the middle, you'll see the end product. Now they're going to use an accelerant on there. What do y'all reckon that accelerant is? <laughs> yes, it's correct. It's alcohol. It's 140 proof corn liquor moonshine. It goes straight through the steel. Darren and Tracy have to go get 50 gallons every Monday. By Friday, it's got to be gone. Whether we burn with it or not, it is. <laughs> it's in that can right there. And it's in this bottle right here. Now this is kind of like a free sample to a sample. Depends on what you do with it. Because the intent of this is to spray it in your hand. You can get a tactile feel of it, you can rub it, it'll feel a little oilier than your whiskey does, but there's a reason for that. And then, if you want to, you can sample it. You can lick it with your hand or whatever you want to it. Depends what you got on your hand, I guess. But, uh, this is a pretty simple procedure. If you want some, hold your hand out. If you want a lot, hold both hands out. If you don't want any, don't hold any hands out. Okay? It's simple. Ready? Think about it, it's 140 proof high quality hand sanitizer. It kills the wrong. <laughs> no, I won't sweeten your drink with it. Good drink. Oh, it's pretty good. Don't wipe it off your hand, I'm going to show you the other trick. You're going to have a good fish. It smells like moonshine. Mm-hmm. That's not going to try it. Did you try it? I did. Oh, it's pretty good. Oh, yeah. Be careful with the slices. This takes both hands. Okay. Yeah. Once you spray it on your hand, spray it on your hand. It's called the three clap method. It's how moonshiners proof whiskey down here. So you take the clap you hand together, rub it, blow it a little bit, not a lot. You can smell the alcohol right up front, no little really plenty. Second time, rub it, smell a little less alcohol, a little bit more corn. Third time, you smell most of the corn, right? Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because between 120 to 140 proof, that whiskey will burn off. If it's a lower proof, it takes a longer to burn off. Hmm. Shit, right? <laughs> yeah. That's how we do it. Any questions? It's weird. When it comes yeah, out from the place, it's big and chunky. Like you see in that picture. Like it is right here. We can't use the big and chunky. We're not going to function it more than this. So Darren Tracy take it over here to the grind house. That's that big building right there. And they grind it down to a consistency that we can use it, which is right here. Once it gets to that consistency there, that's perfect for what we need. And we get ready to put it in our charcoal melon glass. Pack it in there, run it through there, and we start dripping our whiskey. Jack would say it sweetens the whiskey. We say it mellows the whiskey. I'll tell you what it actually does when we get up to charcoal mellow. Okay? Mm-hmm. That big thing you asked me about, that's our charcoal storage. Gotcha. All right, any questions? Mm-hmm. Ask them if you got them. All right, look here. This is Jay Davis got its own fire brigade. It's made up of full time employees and professionally trained firefighters. If they're not already firefighters or 
uh, paramedics when we, they get here. We send them over to uh, Bedford County, next county over, that's our state academy. And they also go to A&M, Texas for industrial fire at their college station. Now we don't put a bunch Woo. of highly trained firefighters in apparatus like this. But one time, this is all we had. This is a, this is fire engine number one. This is a 1919 American of France, made in Elmira, New York, 1919. It doesn't run anymore. It's a hundred plus years old. <laughs> <laughs> this is a 1928, and this ain't far behind. 1928 Ario Speed Wagon. You ever heard the band Ario yeah. Speed Wagon? <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, it stands for Ransom Eli Oates, who's the manufacturer of the Oldsmobile, but he also made this apparatus for a little while. All right, y'all, Jack Daniels. Uh, this is the source of water for Jack Daniels. Jack set up here in the 1880s with the hair. Jack was looking for a cool, clear, iron free source of water for his business. We moved over here. This water's good and clear. It's iron free, it's 50, 60 degrees year round. What's important about that? The iron free part, okay? Uh, if you don't know anything about making whiskey water, it's like the bones of the whiskey, it's what everything's attached to. If you ain't got a good water, you're not gonna have a good whiskey. For our purposes, it has to be iron free. Why does it have to be iron free? Well, take a water, make a water, use a water to make whiskey with it. It's got a high iron content, put it in a barrel, put it in our barrel house in four to seven years. Put that whiskey black and give them a foul taste. The iron and alcohol chemicals, they're antagonists. They don't play well together. Jack knew that then. We still use that same water today. Why is it iron free? This is a limestone cave. Okay? Limestone will lose the iron. Well, you can also, of course, calcium to make it in there. It gives you a sweet taste. If you ever heard of places like Sweetwater, Tennessee, Sweetwater, Florida, Sweetwater, Texas, they're all named after that water source. It's a limestone. How did Jack know what it was? By the taste. Okay, it's got a sweet taste to it. That's the name. Um, we taught Jack how to make this. Jack used to wake up one morning in the early age, right away from seven, say, I'm finally smiling through water, making this whiskey. He had to learn from somebody. Jack learned from two men, Dan Call and Uncle Pierce. Now, Dan, he moved here uh, from North Carolina. Uncle Pierce moved here from Texas. Uncle Pierce was the first one to make whiskey. Uncle Pierce was the first one to make whiskey. Uncle Pierce was the first one to make whiskey. Uncle Pierce was the first one to make whiskey. Uncle Pierce was the first one to make whiskey. They, they were making money sound like everybody else around here. That's pretty much how you got a lot of money out of your board. So they started selling just like that. They did it in North Carolina. There's still a distillery in North Carolina in Wilsburg, all of them. But, uh, so man, he, he grew up, he had his own dry goods store, he had his own still, still, he had his own farm, had his own, uh, that's how he met Jack in the dry goods store, had his own uh, church. Dan was a Lutheran minister. So, you know, he preached about the Spirit on Sunday. He'd sell it ever since days ago. <laughs> Jack, I'm going to make whiskey for the preacher. And a one armed enslaved man named Nathan Nearest Green. Well, Nathan Nearest is a profession we know around here. But his real name is Nathan Green. Now, Nathan Nearest was, uh, Dan would tell Jack he's one of the best whiskey makers around the side of the silk. And they both taught Jack how to make whiskey. They're talking about fermentation, distillation, the kind of water to use. Uh, and a mash bill or a drain bill. A mash bill is a percentage of the corn, barley, and rice put the whiskey to get it that flavor. Okay? A lot of different whiskeys, different percentages of those three grains. American whiskey, like that's But they told Jack one day, he kind of tweaked a little bit, Jack like a little bit more line. That's what we do today, is Jack's a real cool. Now that attention to detail, that here to tradition. Quality of the products we got in our whiskey, it's the quality of the products we got making our whiskey. It's the quality of the products we got making our whiskey. It's the reason we're making our whiskey in the long time. You ain't got to believe it. Any questions? This is Jack Newton, Daniel. Jack Newton, Daniel. Jack Newton, Daniel. Jack Newton, Daniel. This is Jasper Newton Daniel. We know him as Jack, but his given name was Jasper Newton Daniel. He got the name Jack from his nine brothers and sisters. He was the 10th of 10 kids. They called him Baby Jackie, and it stuck. And that's how we know him today as Jack Daniel. Jack Daniel. This is not the original statue that stood here. The original statue that stood here stood here from 1941 to the year 2000. That one you saw in the visitor center when you walked in the front door. If you got any powers of observation at all, you should have seen him. <laughs> He's standing right there. He's like our Walmart greeter. He's the first thing you see when you walk in. Now that one stood here from 1941 to the year 2000. 
That one's made out of Italian marble. It was commissioned by his nephew, Lim Motlow, okay, 30 years after Jack died. That one in the business center, 1,200 pounds of Italian marble, like I said, and that one is Jack's actual height. Jack was only five foot two inches tall and he's liable with size four shoes. <laughs> he's a little fella. <laughs> This guy can contrast, he's five foot six, weighs about 650 pounds, sporting size seven. No, I don't know why they made him taller than the original Jack, or why they got him striking a Captain Morgan pose. <laughs> but this one is Jack oh, on the rock. Think about it. That's one of our grain silos. And there we fill it with 150 truckloads, corn, barley, and rye. That's about 100,000 pounds. We want to put that land mass corn is what we use the most of. It's about 95 acres of corn a day. We make a little whiskey here. Yeah, you do. Uh, that's Jack's office. That's the oldest building at the distillery. We'll go in there in a second. Um, now in there, when we first go in, I'm going to cover some of this because, you know, the front desk kind of made me late and I still got a time schedule to do. They don't care whether they made you late or not. So, inside there, you're going to see three. Jack's only got, it's like a health food product. It's only got six ingredients. They're all natural. A cave springs water right there. Corn, barley, rye. Yeast is proprietary to Jack, same strain he used. And the leftover fermentation from the last process called sour mash or sat back. Y'all know what sourdough bread is? Same principle. And that's all we use to make our whiskeys. We don't have any artificial colors, flavors, or sugars added. Like some of those Kentucky whiskeys there. <laughs> Jack Daniel's motto was every day we make it, we'll make it the best we can, and we still do that to this day. Any questions? So right. over there is our steel house. I'm going to tell you about the steel house real quick. I'm going to tell you about how it works as quick as I can, and then when we go in there, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. So the steel house is that big building past the silo. Now in there, we've got 40 foot tall steel. They are 40 foot tall. The two in the center will be the largest. They produce 35 to 40 gallons a minute. That's a minute. The two on the ends produce more, uh, 15 gallons a minute. Minimum. Now, on the side of the steel line, I'll point it out when we get in there, is that health food product I was talking about, corn, barley, rye, yeast, water, setback. That's mash. It's fermented when you see it. And you'll see right next to it where I point out, you'll see a, a uh, circular window, and it'll have a yellow substance running up through it, a little like cornbread fix. <laughs> Okay. That's fermented. That's fermented. So we got to get that alcohol out. How do we do it? We push that mash all the way to the top. When we get it to the top, we force it down. As it comes down, we pour steam up. That steam cooks the alcohol out of the mash, turns it into a vapor. That alcohol-laden vapor rises to the top. When we get it to the top, we collect it in the condenser, what moonshiners call the worm. Y'all ever see that? Y'all see that copper coil yeah, in the visitor center? Yeah. That's a that's a worm, and it always sits in a cool barrel of water. It's basically just a hillbilly condenser, and it condenses that vapor back down into a liquid. And I'll show you that liquid in there. And that liquid's what same stuff I sprayed on your hands. 140 proof corn liquor moonshine. We call it white dog here. Okay. Any questions? Follow me. Y'all come on in, we got plenty of room. All right, dog, this is Jack's office. Uh, and this is his distillery crew. This is the master distiller's wall, okay? This is Jack and his distillery crew, 1895, 1900. If you do a search on the internet, looking for Jack Angus, this is an iconic picture, it'll pop up. First thing you see, oh, some of the first thing you see. This is Jack right here, he's the only man standing. You can see that that illustrates how short he was. Also, if you do a, uh, uh, a search for nearest grain or uncle nearest, this picture will come up as well and they have a red circle around it saying that's nearest. Well, it ain't, okay? That's his son, George. We don't have any pictures of nearest, but that's George. Uh, now, George started working here with Jack. Jack paid him the same wage as everybody else. Jack basically grew up with him. He knew his father to turn how to make whiskey. And then uh, he liked it so much, old George did, that he got his other brothers to come over here. And then the six of them worked here. The six of them worked here their entire lives. Now their grandchildren and children, our children and grand worked here after them. Their grandchildren worked here after them. There's been a green work here for the last hundred and some years. The families are a lot of a lot of families work here generationally. 
Uh, some of mine worked here before me. Jack still, some of his still work here. Just again. Now Jack was a master stiller while he was here. He passed along to uh, Jess Montlow, that's his nephew. Lem Tolly, that's his grandnephew. Mr. Campbell, Mr. Frank Frog Bobo, which just passed away recently. He was our oldest living master stiller. Then we got Mr. Jimmy Becker, uh, and then with Jeff Barnett, Jeff, he decided he's gonna retire and go make his own whiskey. It's called the company, it's called Company Whiskey, or the Whiskey Company. He makes Company Whiskey. They ain't little original, which is good whiskey. Uh, we don't hold it any will, will. He did a good job for us. And then he passed it along to Chris Fletcher. Now, Chris is a hometown boy. Mr. Bobo was his granddad. He used to come visit him down here. And, uh, but he worked at other distilleries before he came over here, and laid his bones, and he came off and he's now our master distiller. Now we got our first lady master distiller. Her name's Lexi Armour Phillips. Lexi, she's from Lynchburg. Her family worked at Lynch, uh, the, the distillery, most of her at will, all the time, most of them most sides. And uh, she works here today. She worked her way on up. She's our master assistant, assistant master distiller. She married a guy that works here. Her mother-in-law works here. I don't know how much of a plus that is, but. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all come on in here. Come on in. All right, y'all, this is Jack's office real quick. That's uh, Jack, Lem Milo, that's who he left the place to. This is the safety kill Jack. Oh, Jack got to work early one morning as a general rule. Jack never got to work early. Oh, this particular morning he did. He's gonna go to Nashville and we'll settle some They get some money out of here in a letter. Um, now he was in a bit of a hurry. He had to catch a train up there in Tullahoma, next town down. And he was on horse and boat. And the sun was just coming up over the ridge when he came in here. Now, he, Jack didn't live in the distillery. He lived in a place called Mulberry, Tennessee, about three months. <laughs> Lem did. Now, Lem came to work here. He, he was usually here before Jack. But Jack was one. He's in a hurry. He had to get some money out of here and a letter because, you know, back in the day, they didn't have ATMs. He had to have some traveling funds. So he comes in and he lights him a lantern. We didn't have electricity here. This is in 1906. 1906. He comes in. He's going to open that safe. Now, he tries the first time and he fails. He thought, well, maybe it's just me. He'll cast the lantern down here closer. Tried it again, still didn't work. Kept on trying. The more he tried, the madder he got. Because, you know, it's kind of frustrating. You know, if you know how to do something, you can't get it to work. Y'all all experienced that problem. But Jack, you know, he had a bad time. He got mad about the eighth or ninth time. And he kicked that safe as hard as he could. Broke the big toe on his left foot. But, you know, he didn't open that safe. And he didn't really know that he broke it. He thought he just stubbed it. He's ever stubbed their toe. Tell me, what do you usually do after you stub your toe? To be honest, swear, swear a lot. Yeah, that's what I generally do. And walk around in circles, I walk all that pain. That's what Jack is doing when he walks around. Then walks over here, sets down his lunch pail. His habit of the day, every time he came to work, he get out the work orders, the day's proceedings, whatever he needed to do. So he opens that sink up. First time, no problem. Which I imagine pissed old Jack off. Jack hobbled over there, got that money out in that letter. He took off. So we in Nashville for about a week. While he was up there, though, he didn't get that foot checked out immediately. You know how guys are, they put grass snake. Finally, when he did go to the doctor, the doctor told him gangrene had set in. He could bear weight on it. He was turning angry, so he went to the doctor. doctor told him gangrene set in. He's going to lose about half that foot. Which, you know, Jack can really, couldn't really afford. He was uh, short enough as it was. <laughs> when he left the doctor three days later, he's a half a foot shorter, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know that's bad. <laughs> Five years, Jack lost him, of course, that leg of gangrene infection. People ask, well, why didn't he try to treat with antibiotics? They didn't have them in Tennessee or in the in 1906. Well, why didn't he treat with whiskey? They played whiskey. Well, they did. He tried. But you know what the Irish say about that? Well, whiskey can't cure. There's no cure for it. It didn't work. October the 9th, 1911, Jack succumbed to his final surgery. He was 61 years old. But Jack wasn't going to live forever. Of course, I'm sorry, but he might live a little longer. I didn't have to work early that morning and lost his temper and keep that safe. So if there's a moral to the story, what is it? Don't come to work early. Don't come to work early. That's great. <laughs> those are our fermentation baths. We got 66 of those. They are 20 foot tall. They hold 40,000 gallons corn, barley, rye, yeast, water, setback. Takes six days to ferment, Jack. I don't know what day it is now because I can't look in. Usually when I look in, I can tell you. 
Uh, I smelled it earlier. It smelled like, well, yesterday it was about on day three, so that, or four, so it's about five today. But it's bubbling in there a little bit. Day one, though, once we started it, it was bubbling a lot. Big old bubbles. I uh, look like we had a heavy boil on there, a, heavy, a lot of heat cooking it, but we don't. It's heat kills yeast. The mash was cooked before we put it together and added the yeast. So, what's causing those bubbles is the yeast. Basically, all fermentation is is yeast having its breakfast, dinner, supper, and lunch. Snacks. It's consuming the sugars in the corn. Helps out by an enzyme in the barley. As it consumes that sugar, it gives off two byproducts, CO2 and alcohol. So those bubbles are essentially made by, well, are, that's what it, I say it is, bubbles, per, uh, the yeast burping. Millions of little yeast cells eating and burping, burping and eating. Reproducing every 20 minutes. And excrete, let's just say they excrete alcohol. <laughs> Unless you really want to know what it is. So as it excretes that alcohol, the thing about that, those bubbles will be big on day one, but they'll start to lessen throughout the next five days. Why is that? Because alcohol is lethal to yeast. So the more it produces, the quicker it starts killing itself off. On day six, it's flat. It's gonna look like cornbread fixes with a high alcohol content. That's when we pump it over to the stills. It's a five to one ratio. For every five gallons of mash, you get one gallon of whiskey. So if that's a 40,000 gallon bat, how much whiskey do you get out of one? Math five. Eight, eight what? Yeah. Eight, eight, eight gallons? Eight thousand. Eight thousand gallons. Get out eight thousand gallons. That's poor bad. We got 66 of those we're making about every six days. So if somebody asked me how much whiskey, how many gallons of whiskey do the math on that? We can figure it out. So what do we do with it? Now, once it comes down out of the steel, we get the alcohol out of it, about 32,000 gallons. We move about 2,000 gallons back to about set, set back and start the next batch. Push the rest on the other side of the hill. We got holding tanks and pumping station. Y'all smell that? That's fermentation. Let's hear that. Uh, what do you reckon we do with that spent mash? We sell it to the local cattle farmers, home farmers too, within a 28 mile radius, about five counties. Corn, barley, rye, yeast, water, setback makes you fat, happy, and gossip. You don't ever see that in <laughs> California? You got about half and half the cows? Our cows are happier. <laughs> we marinate them from the inside out on the hook. <laughs> so when you leave here, you look out in the farmer's fields and you see the cattle kind of staggering around. <laughs> they got fed recently. <laughs> Any questions? Follow me. Start drinking whiskey. Yeah. Why is everything black? What, what do you see this mold and stuff? Well, that's what it is. It's a microflooring organism. It only grows when there's large quantities of yeast and alcohol. Still. It's dormant everywhere. If you make large quantities of yeast and alcohol, it starts beating. And that's it. It's called Moidonia compacina. Moonshiners call it tattletale moss <laughs> for obvious reasons. It's harmless. They first noticed it back when. French, French wine, they started making large large quantities of that, started growing on their barrel houses. Any questions? Follow me. All right, y'all, this is Baldwin. Baldwin don't work on my on Saturdays and Sundays, thus the reason they're not here. This is not main bottling. This is only bottling for our black light, our, I'm sorry, our single barrels and some of our specialty whiskeys, things that we do limited runs of. This was main bottling up to about 1978. Then we moved down south about two and a half kilometers, or oh, one and a half miles. Uh, this is the oldest. Back when we used this, we only bottled twice a year, spring and fall, and that was all. Now it's five days a week, 24 hours of five. <laughs> How many times do we use our barrels? I usually answer that in barrels. We only use them once. Then what do we do with them? We drink scotch. 
Scotch, Scotch whiskey makers buy our barrels. They're the primary consumers. Who drinks Irish whiskey? Irish whiskey makers. Who drinks tequila? I mean tequila. <laughs> tequila makers. Who drinks rum like Appleton's? They use our barrels. Who eats Tabasco sauce? They use our barrels. <laughs> hey, what's the significance of number seven? Nobody knows. Jack never told anybody. <laughs> Who asked that? You? Yeah, Jack never told anybody. He Nobody knows. It could because he had seven girlfriends and that seventh was his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> it could be that he uh, he sent seven bottles, uh, he sent seven barrels to uh, St. Louis, Missouri Ooh. for the World's Fair in 1904. And that's when he won the World's Fair. He thought that was a good number. How you feeling after drinking Jack Daniels? I feel buzzed. <laughs> Say goodbye. Bye, Jack Daniels. <laughs>